ladies and gentlemen ladies and gentlemen good afternoon my privilege to greet all of you on behalf of uh, the india international center from delhi where the temperature is only 38 degrees indeed glad to know that um, a good many of uh, non members of the iic are also participating in this program the india international center welcomes them in with great joy we have with us ladies and gentlemen three distinguished uh, panelists shri ajit kolashedi Ms. Nassim Begum and uh, Mr. Reven Dizuza. We also have with us uh, Tete, Chief of uh, Program Division of uh, IIC, who has uh, brought all of us together in cyberspace and has chosen to remain invisible. Thank you, Tete. the media have not given due importance to the return of uh, lakhs of indian nationals mostly from the gcc in the recent past there is more than one reason for their return the pandemic of course is one if the company is shut and uh, if he is not paid the employee has to return to his country yet another reason is the move to reduce the number of foreign workers because of lack of employment for citizens there might be another reason too most of the construction work is over the need for foreign workers has come down questions that the panelists might consider addressing are one why this reverse migration two how have the central and state governments and the rest of the society responded three how do our embassies uh, look after the welfare of our compatriots is there any good suggestion to give in this context four is there a comprehensive policy framework and uh, institutional framework in india to address this whole matter in a holistic manner as we all know india tops the list of uh, countries receiving remittances from abroad we are fortunate to have three distinguished panelists each of them has kindly agreed to speak for about 10 minutes to leave time for q and a the most important part of any such program you may kindly <clears throat> type out uh, your questions uh, and send the same through the chat box and if you choose you can indicate to which particular panelist you are addressing the question the first to speak is uh, Shri Ajit Kolasheri, General Manager of uh, Norka Roots, Government of Kerala. I wonder how many lakhs of NRKs Shri Kolasheri has to be engaged with uh, every day, since Kerala has taken a good part of the returnees. Uh, we want to know how Kerala. the government and the society have addressed the challenges over to you shri polashedi 
Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir, first of all, uh, let me brief about a few words about uh, my organization, North Car Roads. So Kerala is the first state to have a separate department that works for the welfare of the resident Keralaites. North Car Roads was established in 2002. It's a registered government company under the non-resident Keralaites office department. It acts as a nodal agency for all matters relating to non-resident Keralaites and implements various welfare schemes to the Keralaites residing, working outside Kerala, within the country and outside the country. So from the time immemorial to Keralaites, the migration has been a bigger option for earning and livelihood. The income of expatriates still plays an important role in the progress of Kerala state. Before entering into the core of the subject, I think that it would be very helpful to let you know about the reality of Kerala. In Kerala, unemployment is high and the growth rate is below the national average. Besides unemployment, the rapidly aging population and low workforce participation are other issues. The number of registered job seekers is assumed to be beyond 35 lakh. Out of them, the number of professional work seekers is estimated to more than 4 lakh. Creating jobs for the unemployment is itself is a Herculean task before the government. The financial position of the state was not conducive for a public investment or and public sector job creations. In such a devastating situation, the, the Kerala, the inward remittance from the diaspora become the one of the perennial source of economic activity in the state. The total number of Emigrants to different countries from Kerala is estimated as around 3.5 million. As I earlier mentioned that the remittance from the NRK is the backbone of Kerala economy, COVID-19 emerged as a crippling blow to our state. And this pandemic has put our state into a deep abyss unlike other states in India and other countries across the world. The state has been facing unprecedented challenges in almost all sectors, health, economy, education, and industry. In such a crisis, huge reverse migration is no peace. So let me tell you, the, the figure of expatriates came from different countries during this pandemic, those who returned to Kerala. Then you can imagine how the, 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 the grave the situation what Kerala faces. The current country based return status as per the Norca's own portal, the COVID Jagrada portal is. As per the current figures from UAE, 9.5 lakh Keralites, Keralites returned during the pandemic period. From Saudi Arabia, 1.8 lakh Keralites returned. From Qatar, it stands 1.7 lakh Keralites returned. From Bahrain, it is 48,000. Kuwait, 54,000, Oman, 1.45 lakh. And the rest of the countries comes around 58,000. So the total number, 1.6 million Keralites returned during the pandemic period. So let us see the reason for return. The pandemic affects almost all countries. The GCC countries, like almost European and Asian countries in the world, decided to reduce the number of foreign workers lacking employment and resources, shortages and closing down of the business, trading activity of 4,000 NRKs along with other Indians to come back. So let me tell you the figures and the reason for return as recorded in Norca's portal. Among the returnees, 11.46 lakh person reported and recorded it as loss of job. This is the gravity of the situation. And 3.16 lakh person recorded their uh, immediate reason for return as expiry of their employment visas. And 32,000 persons were senior citizens. And 91,000 were children below 10 years. And 14,000 pregnant women. And uh, 3,000 persons accompanied their spouses. And this is the split up of 1.6 million persons who returned back to Kerala. Sudden loss of jobs devastated the migrant both physical and mental states. 
their sudden influx caused an instantaneous rise in the labor markets, both in the rural and urban economies in Kerala. It naturally resulted in unemployment in all sections of the society. Due to the influx of huge number of unskilled retainees in agriculture sector, laborers are not getting the required amount of work days for stabilizing their living condition. Likewise, the skilled laborers, semi-skilled laborers, all are fa uh, facing many challenges and become non-productive due to lack of jobs and, ex and also due to the extended lockdowns. As the retainees have been compelled and forced to work a low-level wage, low level wage employment, their average monthly income, income would drastically decline. It's a matter of concern for them from the point of view of the standard of living. So effectively, effective policy responses for engagement of non-resident Keralaites retaining in both urban and rural area is the only solution to curb its negative effect. The government of Kerala suitable mechanism is to reinstate returned migrant into labor market, ensuring their social security in any socio-economical or health-related undesirable situation. Having considered all the current factors of the state, the state government envisaged number of schemes to rehabilitate a large retainee population. The first and the immediate uh, 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 project what we launched is sanctioning an immediate ex gratia financial assistance to stranded anarchists in Kerala. Once the COVID outbreak spread all over the world, a large number of non-resident Keralaites were stranded in Kerala due to the suspension of flight operation to various countries. In this context, the government of Kerala announced an immediate ex gratia support of rupees 5,000 to each NRKs who returned to Kerala from the 1st January 2020 and could not travel back to their destination countries to resume work. The scheme mainly aims blue collared workers. So far, we supported 1.75 lakh plus applicants under this under the scheme. Another project exclusively started during the period of the contest is Dream Kerala. Dream Kerala. The government of Kerala launched this project to rehabilitate expatriate of various categories by obtaining constructive suggestions from the public. The ideas received from the public through a dedicated portal was forwarded to an expert committee of Dream Kerala for scrutiny and for conceiving projects. And as for the responses of the expert committee, the rehabilitations of the expatriates are being arranged. And one of the suggestions was to set up a skilled repository portal. The portal has already been launched. And this portal creates a platform for bridging retaining migrants with potential domestic employees as well as international employees. Financial but equity assistance will be given to interested migrants reskilling options upskilling and reskilling options are also there and uh, that will be provided to those interested or who needs employment wage employment in india and abroad so far 50 plus employees from domestic as well as from international from it automotive retail hospitality and health sector have registered with the portal Another major rehabilitation project is known as Pravasi Badrada, a coordinated reintegration program for NRK. This is a new comprehensive rehabilitation project launched with the support of the government of Kerala to support the entrepreneurship ventures of the retaining migrant with active support of various financial institutions in Kerala. And the main rehabilitation schemes under this Pravasi Badrada project is First is Nano Enterprise Scheme to support ski to through Kudumbasri Mission. The Nano Enterprise Scheme addresses low profile category of NRK retainees. It is implemented through the Kudumbasri Mission, a flagship poverty alleviation and women empowerment platform of Government of Kerala. It provides NRK retainees with a sustainable livelihood option. The main feature of this scheme is that the targeted individual can avail interest free loans without any collateral up to two lakhs and repayment with equal installments. And we expect more than 2,000 plus nano self-employment ventures under the scheme. 
And the second uh, project is micro enterprises assistance through the cooperative sector of Kerala. The scheme assists NRK retainees to set up micro and small scale industries. It is implemented through the corporate support of the cooperative sector like Kerala Bank and other similar financial institutions in Kerala. The main feature of the scheme is that the provinces can get entrepreneurship ass assistance, loan assistance up to 5 lakh under the, the scheme. Capital subsidy is at the percent of 25% of the loan amount up to a maximum 1 lakh rupees. And in addition to this capital uh, subsidy, we are providing interest incentives, interest subvention for the first four years. And the Mega Enterprises Assistance Scheme is the third project under the Pravasi Badrida. Under this scheme, the Kerala State Industrial Development Corporation provides loans from 25 lakhs to 2 crores to eligible retaining migrants for their enterprises. This scheme supports 100 plus mega projects and Norka Roots provides interest subvention to all loanies. And another flagship project is Norka Department Project for Return Immigrant. And this project started in 2013, that is the period of the Saudi Nithakat, and has been continuing. And under this project, entrepreneurship support, assistance, financial assistance, training, and handholding are being given to the returning migrant community. And the maximum project amount under this project is 30 lakhs, and with 15% capital subsidy and 3% interest subvention for the consecutive uh, continuous four years is also offered under this project. Norca Roots has now tied up with 15 financial institutions. All major uh, nationalized and scheduled banks are with us. And across the state, 5,000 branches of this company, uh, these banks are providing this uh, entrepreneurship support scheme to retain a migrant community. The government intends to create Kerala Knowledge Economy Mission under the Kerala Development of Innovative Strategic Council for spearheading the body. And the purpose is to boost the job prospects in the state by supporting knowledge workers. And it aims to provide employment to the educated and support knowledge workers under this single program. And we are also adding the retaining migrants to under this project also. In short, through this above mentioned scheme, the state government intends to utilize Kerala Mammoth workforce and innovative skills in building domestic capacity and to create public and private job supply chains to support the returning migrant community. Let me conclude being a participant, I am honored and I thank the distinguished moderator and the co panelist for making this discussion fruitful. I also thank the gentleman for giving me this great opportunity. Thank you and thank you. Thanks. Thank you, uh, General Manager Polasheri. You have given us most useful information and insights. We particularly note that uh, you had a portal for inviting uh, suggestions from the public that shows that uh, you want to have create synergy between the government and the people, which is very, very important. Uh, now it is uh, our privilege to ask uh, Nazim Begum to speak to us. Now, Mr. Uh, Shri Kolasheri spoke to us from Tirumanandapuram. Now we go to Guru Gram. Nasim has spent about 15, 16 years in the Gulf uh, as a journalist. And she's also the author of a brilliant book, My Mother Did Not Go Bold. So over to you, Nasim. Thank you, Ambassador Fabian. And uh, first of all, let me thank you for such, uh, choosing such a uh, very important topic, which our governments or any other institutions have uh, taken so seriously till now. So let me go straight into the topic. In my opinion, there is a reverse migration. It's a 
glorified term for people returning from, uh, after losing their job but now we are analyzing the situation in the context of covid-19 and localization of jobs happening uh, in the various gulf countries but actually when you uh, do a small research it is not very difficult to find that this reverse migration what we are discussing now has started in 1990s as early as 1990s it started but our government or the policy makers nobody has given a due attention to that issue that time maybe the government the governments took a wait and watch approach or they might not be aware of the severity of the issue that it is going to cause to the country whatever it is the case reverse migration means then people returning to their uh, india after losing their jobs in a uh, first nation so but it, it is also true now with, with uh, what mr ajit kolasheri has said we have so many numbers when we talk about the migrant lab, uh, population or migrant laborers or expats it's always the numbers we talk about the remittances in numbers we talk about the people in numbers but these people are human beings so what are they going to do when they return after losing job this is where we are lacking behind our governments they are not eager to uh, attend to this problem so uh, while coming to delhi i got a chance to meet uh, d raja the senior cpi leader so it was a chance meeting so i asked him what is the parliament doing uh, have you ever discussed about the repatriates issue in the parliament so he told me he is we all know he is a senior parliamentarian he he has been an mp for a such a long time he said in my lifetime i have never heard about a discussion in the parliament regarding the repatriation problems issues so what the parliament discusses is about the remittances or the number of people uh, going outside which also the government doesn't have a proper uh, data of how many people are going outside the country if we need a number we depend upon the w uh, uh, sorry ilo or any other un organizations which give us the number so this many people have are the diaspora of indian community our government does not have a proper number while i was working with a uh, we uh, are meeting with the ambassador of that house so i asked him the same question how many indians are outside the country he said there is no such data so if you ask now also the office officials concerned uh, tell you we don't have any proper data on people going outside so whenever we talk about another issue what i i want to highlight is whenever we talk about the migrant population we think about the blue collar workers i am not uh, with it uh, i am not uh, seeing their issue as very small minor but there are also people very professionals and uh, li- uh, losing jobs or there are so many people living how do we know how many professionals are working outside we always think about the blue collar workers but if you go outside everybody is in labor so the public is including the all the jobs and professionals in this migrant migrant workers list and also the other uh, neglected section are women do we know how many women are working outside we don't know we always think about the construction workers as the migrant population which is not fair so in this pandemic also so many people returned so mr our foreign external affairs minister mr jayshankar said 48.5 lakh uh, sorry if i am wrong uh, uh, 43.45 uh, lakh people returned from 98 countries so among this number in this number how many belong to the migrant pop- uh, sorry the reverse migrant population so we don't know so these people who return from 98 nations in group people who just try to return to their country during the pandemic and kerala uh, or states like kerala or punjab andhra pradesh only few states have a data on the number of people who returned so it's high time 
the government has to think about creating a policy for those who are actually suffering because of this pandemic and who are the actual members of this rivers uh, whatever we call it i i, I call them jobless people so lakhs and lakhs of people have returned returned to india without job how are they living how how is their family is going how are they meeting their daily expenses all of them does not have bank uh, like uh, deposits in their bank accounts and coming back to after these repatriates the biggest problem they find is to get a job to get a proper job we don't have such policy also why can't we include the repatriates if we, why can't we allot some kind of jobs for the repatriates so there are so many issues related with this thing and also uh, in 90 uh, this repatriation started we heard in the beginning for the first time during the kuwait war then when the great recession came then now it is localization everywhere from uae to oman localization is in full swing so there were signs then there were warnings that these things are going to happen but the government or the state governments or the central government whoever it is nobody has taken these things seriously because they thought for them just gulf or uh, expatriates means just the money money flow into the country they have never cared about the human beings who are sending the money so uh, thank you mr uh, fabian and uh, iic for uh, raising up this issue at even at this time it's high time we need to discuss all these things so i think uh, norca uh, uh, is doing a good job still everything is for the uh, labor population i'm not saying we are not we don't have to look after them we have to but at the same time create a portal for uh, highly uh, skilled qualify, qualified uh, professionals and women who are the two neglected sections of the uh, diaspora so i think this discussion will lead to such a the policy at least some kind of discussions will happen over this issue that's all what i have to say thank you so much and uh, i i want to add one more thing yeah our immigration act was i think it, it was created in uh, 1983 what happened to that policy have we revamped the policy not at but the other gulf nations they have revamped their labor policies but we are not doing any proper amendments to this century old or, or or our laws then also this amnities we all uh, uh, being a journalist also we all give good coverage for the amnesties so amnesties is also a kind of regularization of citizenship and regularization of jobs so many things but it is also it's a ploy of the gcc nations to send back laborers back to india so they want to it's they also there is big unemployment issues in countries like saudi arabia even in uh, oman everywhere there are unemployment so they have to look after their people also so they have trying to accommodate more of the local people in jobs so now even now but asian laborers are in need because they are reluctant to do menial jobs like the asian workers so this thing will change in uae when now you can see uh, emirati women working as uh, the door keepers or uh, billing uh, uh, professionals small small jobs they have started doing it so as years go by we will lose out to them also so something has to be done something has to be done then then yeah one day by admission i mentioned it is for 45.82 lakh people then the government is trying to introduce the minimum wage terms for the laborers that is another attempt to please the uh, uh, foreign nations that we are going to provide cheap labor in the long run it does not help us or the uh, the what the governments can do is create more job opportunities in the country so we can either we can stop people from going outside the country or when somebody comes back to 
the uh, India after losing their jobs or if the reverse migration happens, it might help them to get into a job. So this, it's time we must start thinking not in terms of numbers, but we have to ad address this situation on humanitarian grounds. Thank you so much. This is what I want to um, uh, make a, a point in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak out these issues openly. Thank you. Thank you, Nazim. Uh, you have spoken from your heart passionately, but not without logic. You said, said uh, you, that, you know, we do not have data. You are absolutely right. In the parliament, the Minister of State said that uh, they were going to collect data from the different states. And you also said that it's not a question of, you know, just numbers, but human beings. You have uh, raised some questions uh, which, uh, you know, need answers. And, uh, you know, IIC always believes in an interactive debate. So it is open to the other panelists also to answer some of the questions which uh, you have raised. Now it is uh, our pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Reven D'Souza because we are now moving to Kuwait. Now Kuwait has a special place in our heart for so many reasons. You know, the media have been talking about uh, Kuwait's plans to reduce the number of foreign workers. Apparently, at present, out of 100 human beings uh, in Kuwait, uh, 70 are foreigners and 30 are Kuwaiti nationals. So the media said that the plans at some time in the future is to make it the other way. That is 30 foreigners and 70 Kuwaitis. But uh, as the st statistics showed recently, only 54,000 came from Kuwait compared to larger numbers from, say, the UAE and elsewhere. Now, I read uh, <clears throat> Times, the Times Kuwait every day to get informed about Kuwait. But I should say that, you know, when I was Joint Secretary Gulf, uh, way back in 1990, when Saddam Hussein decided to have a picnic in Kuwait, a very wrong decision, I did not have the benefit of uh, time, the Times Kuwait. Yeah. Mr. D'Souza is the founder managing editor of uh, that very, very useful publication. And uh, let us now listen to Mr. D'Souza, over to you, Mr. D'Souza. Very good evening, uh, uh, Excellency Ambassador Fabian. And I'm sure all the people in Kuwait uh, who were here during the invasion, like myself, know you well and your role in evacuation of uh, uh, Indian community, which was, I think, part of the Guinness Book of World Records. So thank you so much for uh, your efforts then. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me today uh, for to speak on this extremely relevant topic, the reverse migration to India from GCC and elsewhere. It is both an honor and privilege to be a panelist in this prestigious forum. The coronavirus pandemic has triggered a massive reverse migration from Gulf countries, unlike anything we have seen since 1990, when the Iraqis invaded and occupied Kuwait for seven long months. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic has made the GCC less welcoming for migrant workers who form the overwhelming majority of its private sector workforce. In addition to COVID-19 related job losses, low education, educated expatriates face active pressure from local government measures to reduce the demographic imbalance in some countries like Kuwait, as you mentioned. In view of these factors, the reverse migration has not been an option, but more so a compulsion that arose out of an uncontrollable situation. So it is 
So is this reverse migration a bad thing or is it a blessing in disguise? I'm not sure if it is either one, but surely Kerala or any other state in India was not prepared for this sudden influx. And while the immediate repercussions may not be as bad as they may sound, any further increase of inflow of migrants might exacerbate an already precarious situation. While a large part of the migrants forced to return have been low income or marginal workers who were unable to withstand the lockdowns, loss of jobs and incomes, which in some cases was a temporary measure uh, that businesses had to adapt so they could uh, continue uh, as they could not continue paying them and paying them. Uh, white collar workers have been have not have also been victims of this pandemic. Their ability to withstand the impact even though better than low income workers cannot be taken for granted because the problem still persists. In such a scenario, let me point out uh, Kuwait's role. As you mentioned, the numbers from Kuwait have been fairly low and uh, I can attribute it to some of the reasons uh, uh, which has limited uh, which has limited the reverse migration to a large extent. Thanks to the Embassy of India uh, initiative uh, to set up uh, an umbrella organization immediately uh, as the pandemic and the migration uh, reverse migration started taking place. The Indian Community Support Group, one of the organizations set up, uh, coordinated relief operations to help our fellow Indians in dire straits to overcome uh, uh, the overwhelming repercussions that they faced during the height of the pandemic. So in a way, the Kuwait model of helping each other in times of difficulty was well appreciated and, and it was also an example that can easily be replicated in other places. Similarly, community and family support ensured that workers were able to sustain themselves despite losing jobs in many sectors last year. As the lockdown restrictions eased, we are now witnessing a shortage of manpower in several industries, both skilled and semi-skilled. Many sectors that closed down because of the pandemic, such as hospitality, travel, entertainment, events, exhibitions, are now slowly opening up. Today, the single largest worry is the return of the migrant back to the Gulf from his hometown because most Gulf countries do not accept them to fly direct due to the COVID pandemic situation in India. The, they are stranded in their homeland waiting for the skies to open up to, to return. The numbers looking to return are staggering, staggeringly high and this is the first and immediate issue that needs to be addressed. And while India strives to create a comprehensive policy set up to address the plight of these migrants in the long term, in the immediate future, the Indian government needs to find solutions to send the migrants back who are required in the Gulf. So among the many actionable suggestions uh, that I could make, setting up a Gulf approved quarantine facility in India for passengers flying out to the GCC, which would permit them to return directly after spending the requisite number of days in local quarantine. Instead of having to fly into third countries at an exorbitant cost that is often unaffordable to many people who may miss out on the on work opportunities unfolding in the Gulf. Helping labor upskill for those who lost their source of income in the Gulf and are back home will provide new opportunities and more value addition. Providing soft loans, as uh, Mr. Ajit mentioned, uh, but not to the tune of 5,000. Uh, I think it would be uh, a much higher amount because that would help them tide over their temporary unemployment. Um, deferring loan repayments un uh, until the migrant is able to overcome the immediate exigencies are some of the immediate steps that can help to buffer the returning migrant suffering. India surely has a pool of unlimited talent and qualified persons required in the Gulf countries. Um, because even though Gulf countries would like to believe that they that their own nationals would replace these migrants in the short term, they are not. Uh, uh, this is not entirely possible, and their nationals are not really ready for this. Uh, for now, the migrant boomerang from the Gulf is more of a temporary phenomenon, and even though a boom may not be expected in the very near future an absolute disaster can also be ruled out. The message, however, is clear that in the long run, we have to prepare and be prepared for the Indian Gulf migrant who will one day have to return home. And the time to diversify and 
not be so dependent on migration for jobs is a message that keeps cropping up time and again. And the first thing we need to do as part of the preparation for any future emergencies is to have an exact count on the number of migrants who are now living in and, in, and will in the future move to countries abroad. The approximations we have been relying on in place of firm numbers is often widely off the mark as the COVID-19 pandemic is proving. Uh, I would also like to mention uh, some of the uh, my co-panelist uh, Nazima mentioned regarding women, joblessness. Uh, there, in, in Kuwait, at least, we have already uh, witnessed uh, that pa the pandemic is slowly, very slowly and gradually being brought under control. Uh, the Indian government has in place some very good laws regarding women employment. We do not send our domestic workers under the age of 30. Uh, we have uh, good systems in place. Uh, uh, that protect them to a large extent. Of course, everyone is not so protected as uh, we would wish them to be, but uh, there is, it's a work in progress. And the government of India has in the past several years uh, implemented and uh, become a little, even the e-migrate system, uh, you know, has, has helped, uh, let's say, reduce the number of, uh, uh, number of uh, violations and uh, issues that uh, the labor force has. So in a nutshell, uh, I would like to conclude uh, saying that uh, reverse migration may not be so bad, uh, uh, like a reverse brain drain or something like that. It, 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 is, it is an opportunity. Uh, people are, uh, nationals come to this part of the world, uh, especially the Gulf. They take back with them not just money, but experience, knowledge. And uh, that also helps them, uh, you know, relocate. Uh, but one thing for sure, we have to realize that, uh, you know, the migrant who comes to the Gulf is aware that uh, he's not here forever. It's not Europe or it's not the U.S. where he can settle down. So it's a temporary job uh, that, that can extend for uh, several, uh, several years. And sometimes, uh, you know, second and third generation are now living in the Gulf. Uh, but ultimately, we have to return and... Uh, the government of India has been working uh, the Pravasi Samman awards and, uh, you know, celebrating the Pravasis has always been on its agenda. Uh, and, and I think in the future, we, we should also look at uh, upskilling our own labor force to be, uh, to be in a position to, uh, you know, uh, provide value addition to jobs. Thank you so much, Excellency. And it was a pleasure to be part of this conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. D'Souza. You have made um, many interesting points. And you have also pointed out that uh, the current uh, reverse migration can be temporary. But even more importantly, you said that uh, over the long term, we have to be prepared for our people coming back because the Gulf is not exactly the West. So the situations are different. Very important point. Now, I just want to make one observation, and that is that our embassies in the Gulf work very hard to take care of uh, our uh, compatriots there. At the same time, I want to raise the question whether they do have enough personnel. I am saying this because when way back when I was in the Gulf, and I believe even now, the Filipino embassy had qualified lawyers attached to the embassy. You know, uh, as labor attaches. So the interesting thing is that uh, if there was a court case or something like that involving a Filipino citizen, then the embassy was able to give direct help, not just give a list of, uh, you know, good uh, lawyers, but direct help. And second thing is that, you know, uh, suppose a maid uh, from 
the Philippines, the country, she does not go immediately to the employer's house. The embassy arranges to put her up for a day or two, gives her a briefing, sort of cultural acclimatization, and then, you know, the employer comes and uh, takes her. Now, this is very important. Now, my question to both uh, Mr. D'Souza as well as to Ms. Nazim Begum is, uh, do you think this is practical? That is, uh, you know, can we sort of uh, strengthen the personnel of the embassies in the Gulf and render the services which I mentioned. Well, over to you, Nazim, first. Okay. Yeah, yeah, why not? We can also do that, especially for this uh, Philippines, they have a wonderful mission, overseas foreign workers. It's the main uh, system mechanism they have to protect workers going to Gulf countries, OFW. Their wages, the, even the minimum wage is fixed. So even the embassy is open 24 by 7 for any Filipino worker. If they face any uh, humiliation or any issue from their sponsors, they can easily take a cab and go to the embassy. They will do anything they want. So this kind of things can happen. We can also introduce if we hire more people in the embassy. When I came to came back to India in a one day by the mission flight, and I know the difficulties we face there because there is no much human resources in the. Not many people are in the embassy to handle everything. So every I I am I, I don't know whether it's right to say in this platform, but. Uh, Please pardon if I am, uh, please forgive me if I am wrong also. Because if unless you are part of an organization with any Indian organization, you can't reach out to the embassy people. It's a hard fact, harsh reality and a hard fact. And uh, other, so this, this, this is not the way Philippines embassy is working. They treat everybody as equal. From a uh, housemaid uh, to an engineer, everybody is treated equally. But when it comes to our Indian diplomatic missions, it's not the same. So as uh, Mr. Ambassador said, we can also start introducing such things to uh, uh, reduce the problem. Also, but still there is a big problem is in, as Indians, we are large in numbers compared to other countries. So that also uh, 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 demands more workforce in the embassies, in the diplomatic missions, or some kind of coordination. So when, when a person is hired, we have so many scrupulous agencies also in Kerala. So, so many visa cheating happening even now. So who is doing all these things? It's not the people in the Gulf nations. Everything starts from India only. Two weeks back, one uh, Gujarati friend told me people are going uh, uh, in uh, what uh, cargo ship to uh, Gulf nations even now. These things are not. Uh, not uh, we, 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 uh, I thought it's a, just a uh, random case. Then he said, no, it's not an uh, uh, like uh, it, it's happening over the time, over the years. He knows so many people who is paying lakhs of money to agents to just to reach uh, Gulf nation. So these kind of things, if you want to stop these kind of things, embassy should function more effectively. The other thing is when I, I went to UAE in 2004, that time there was a portal to register our names with our uh, employment, uh, employers, sponsors, details, everything. I don't know, over the years I haven't done. I have done only that once. Over the year, nobody has heard about this. there is such a portal uh, in the embassy to give our details. And I am sure 90% of the people there are not aware of 
this thing, this portal where we can register our names. So, so much there should be a kind of awareness campaigns from, it should start from the embassy level and we can utilize all the media also to take all these things to the people. So somebody, before they starts from uh, India, we can make aware of them go. When you reach there, you register in the portal. So through this, the government also get an idea about the number of people reaching in Gulf nations. So as you said, sir, it's good. We can, at least we can uh, uh, suggest these things to the government and let the next, this migration is not going to stop. As Mr. D'Souza said, this will continue. So this is the time at least we can think about improving the next generation of migration. Thank you. So over to Mr. D'Souza. Hello. Hello. Yes, Mr. D'Souza, please go ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, to, uh, to answer that question regarding Indian missions, uh, you know, the Indian mission, it's, it's, I don't know if to say whether sometimes it's fashionable and, uh, you know, we like to blame our uh, missions. But in Kuwait, uh, unfortunately, the mission is working 25 7 uh, during this COVID times. They have really, uh, you know, uh, uh, showcased how a, a mission uh, should have, uh, should have uh, risen to the occasion in terms of uh, uh, providing assistance 24 seven, in terms of uh, reaching out, in terms of uh, whatever possible within the limits of their uh, op operations in the country. Uh, the Indian mission has really excelled uh, and that is indicative of the number of uh, re return migrants um, because uh, we, we also had lockdowns, we had uh, uh, curfews and everything else. But uh, I think I think the mission can only be, we have, you know, the mission now is, is dealing with Indian nationals in 14 languages. Uh, we have various strata of society from the lowest uh, to the highest. So in a way, in a way, the uh, Philippine, uh, I'm also dealing because of my position, I'm also dealing very actively with the Filipinos. It looks, the grass looks greener, but really they are, they are, uh, uh, they are dealing with one language. They are dealing with a very uh, single segment of uh, domestics out of the 200 or thousand that they have. Uh, maybe more than 75% uh, are domestic workers, educated and of course uh, uh, well to do in, in terms of their own profession. But uh, the Indian embassy has a very vast, I mean, we have uh, laborers, we have various other kinds of issues where uh, salaries are not paid. But our mission at this time of COVID, uh, unlike in 1990, uh, Ambassador Fabian would know, where there was a total chaos during the, uh, that was a war, of course, and now it's uh, different, it's a health issue. But uh, our mission really uh, supported uh, and implemented uh, advice and uh, strategy that uh, that is now reaping fruits. So uh, it's not easy to handle uh, 1 million Indians. We are 1 million in Kuwait and uh, you know it's a work in progress the emb embassy is always looking forward to to upgrade upskill their own uh, efforts indian nationals also as uh, nazima mentioned the the corruption starts from back home uh, they come in cargo ships or they or, or there are illegal uh, migrants or we call them uh, undocumented uh, so so these issues will keep cropping up and uh, and uh, you know, uh, let's say the the mission is dealing with with the whole whole course of problems, educating uh, educating uh, a national the, of the local laws is, is itself a very big challenge because when they come, uh, some of them the the newly uh, new recruits are not are not uh, really understanding that they they, they 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 go into hearsay. So so the embassy is really uh, trying to you know uh, reach out to all of them. Uh, the present embassy uh, uh, group is trying to communicate and, and, and make sure the communication reaches a lot of people. Just documenting workers uh, for their arrival and departure is a, is a huge process. And in fact, it is sometimes even a, a, a such a tiresome process because 
um, you know, it, it, uh, uh, people want to be free. They, they use Kuwait. They will come in here for a year, two years. Some of them keep their visas, but they don't stay here. They just use it as a, as an alibi for their NRI status. So there are various issues, but uh, really in effect, um, you know, uh, the embassy is, uh, embassy or embassies are doing as much as they can. And, uh, you know, the community, community help support reaching out is very essential because we cannot depend everything on the embassy so we have a lot of associations community support groups that reach out and make sure that uh, you know uh, issues that are, 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 are uh, that are really not able to be uh, handled or our fellow indians do not suffer like during the pandemic we made sure that no indian sleeps hungry this was one of our mission we had numbers, we had passes, we, we made sure that nobody sleeps hungry. We had money collected from the community and also provided by the embassy. You know, so reaching objectives and helping each other was, was paramount. So, so that's what my, uh, my, my reply to you, Ambassador. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. D'Souza, and thank you, Najim. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, I was, uh, you know, out of it because there was a power failure here. Now, I am sure, and I am sure all of you will agree with me that our embassies are working 24-7. There is no doubt about it. At the same time, they could do with additional personnel. And here, a question might arise. Do we have the funds for it? And uh, I wish to give an answer to that question. When I was in Rome, you know, Every month, the ministry sends us money through the bank. But in the case of some of the embassies uh, in the Gulf, uh, it is the embassy which sends money to the ministry, <laughs> not the other way around. Why? Because the consular revenue, you know, the money which you collect by giving consular service services is so huge that the embassy doesn't need any money from the ministry. So the financial resources are there. And uh, I would also suggest uh, that uh, we should also make sure that uh, in our embassies, uh, there are enough staff who speak the mother tongue of uh, our citizens who need that 24-7 help, you know, because if you if you are a maid and if you have to go to the embassy at 2 o'clock in the morning, well, the maid may or may not speak English or Hindi. The maid might be speaking only Bengali or Malayalam. So, in fact, it can be done and I'm sure it is being done. But uh, additional personnel will be welcome. Now, uh, I do not see any particular question here, but uh, I have uh, another question, and that is uh, to Mr. D'Souza. Is it correct to say that uh, most of the construction work in the Gulf, most of it is already done? You know, you can't have more highways and uh, more buildings and all that. And therefore, the number of uh, uh, the need for construction workers is coming down. Is it a correct assessment? Excellency, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's it's partly correct because uh, the work is not yet done. Uh, in Kuwait, we have, because uh, the price of oil, you know, they shelf projects during the drop in price of oil. Uh, the price of oil is steady now. There is huge uh, projects in the pipeline. And I would think so with Saudi Arabia and I would think so with Qatar as well, uh, with the 2022 World Cup coming up. Um, but construction, uh, as, as you have mentioned, the, the countries are moving into uh, knowledge economy. There are various other facets of the economy besides construction and construction uh, replenishment uh, will, will obviously be coming every 20, 25 years because old infrastructure has to be replaced uh, or upgraded. So I don't think that, uh, okay, the large numbers are, are uh, uh, you know, let's say 
are not going to be required because there is going to be growth and development and many of the economies are now looking to di diversify uh, many of the uh, uh, locals are not uh, i mean uh, uh, require jobs they're looking at new businesses they need foreigners preferably indians to some extent to to uh, fit into those uh, opportunities because you know they still have a very uh, high high uh, uh, maintenance and uh, they they are very privileged class so they don't indulge in many many of the jobs that as that are undertaken by uh, by indian or uh, foreign uh, migrant workers so i don't see a very great drop there might be a, a, a decline but this is also a wake, wake up call for people who sometimes are in their slumber and thinking that they will be here forever uh, they, 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 the preparation, uh, uh, you know, many people I know now are planning to leave in the next one, two, three, four, five years and leave uh, in a uh, dignified way, not in, in a way that they, they left and they cannot come back, but retire or, or, you know, migrate to another third country. Opportunities are there in the West, as you mentioned. And, and uh, this is how we see it. And uh, right now, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, this point is very relevant, we need to get back all the gulf migrants who are to return back and and this is one of the big challenge that the indian government has and uh, has to undertake because they are in hundreds of thousands stuck back home and uh, whether it's because of our vaccine uh, or whether because of our the the uh, we could not control the virus spread uh, these nationals are required these indian uh, citizens are required to contribute and come back they have their jobs but they just can't get back so this is creating a huge problem for everybody uh, people here uh, because the cost of living will go up uh, labor supply is, uh, is is there's been absolutely no new labor for a year and a half and and uh, so you're really not going to be uh, comfortable with spending twice as much for your labor when you could get cheaper labor and a larger number and and indian government should look at this issue very closely how to get their people back into the gulf who are required you know they have their valid visas and the companies require them thank you uh, investor um thank you so much uh, mr dzusa it is past uh, five o'clock and uh, it is time for us to conclude uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us give a big hand to our distinguished panelists, uh, Mr. D'Souza, Ms. Nazim Begum, and uh, Mr. Kolasheri, who sent me a message saying that, you know, because of some urgency, he had to leave. So let's give them a big hand. And on behalf of the IIC, we wish to you a big hand to the distinguished panelists and to the distinguished participants. And on my own behalf, thank you, Tete, also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.